Thank you, Rusty. Good morning. This morning, we are here to talk about good news. In this world today, we need good news now more than ever. This is what Peter was alluding to, though, in the first century. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 40, he said, With many other words, he entreated them, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. If there was a crooked generation then, he's referring to the world. He's referring to the opposite of the good news that was just proclaimed to them to where they could save themselves from this crooked generation. If it was crooked then, it was bad news then. The good news is, there's good news for us today. Every generation that has followed, that has followed the world's path, has followed bad news, has caused them to be crooked and as veering away from the path that God would have for them. Good news is needed now more than ever. And if you'll notice what Rusty just read for us in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, good news is mentioned. And so very, very quickly, we're going to focus for the, for the remaining part of the lesson on the concept of good news and the fact that Jesus was born. The fact that Jesus was born, it is good news. It's good news that Jesus was born. You know, oftentimes I've heard it say, well, Jesus was born and, and therefore it's, uh, it's good news because He had to die. He couldn't have died without being born. But what the angel told the shepherds was very matter-of-factly, the fact that He was born is good news. And in this world today, we are celebrating that concept. On Wednesday, the world celebrates that Jesus was born on December 25th. Now tonight, we're going to be handling our, if you'll notice, tonight is it's going to be our question and answer tonight. So we're, the first question we're going to be looking at is, was Jesus born on December 25th? And so when it comes to that, we can look at the, that concept, and, and that really does dwell in, in a question and answer night. But what we're going to focus on this morning is that Jesus was born. Regardless of the day, He was born. Amen? Jesus was born. And it's good news that He was born. In Luke chapter 2, I'm going to begin again in, in, in verse 8. And we're going to go through, and, and in fact, there's a statement that's made that we often hear during this time of year. It says, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And, and, and remember that for tonight. Keeping watch over their flock by night. That is key for answering that question I just asked before. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not. So notice their response to what they've just seen was something that would bring fear. They're seeing bad news. But he says, Fear not. Behold, I bring you, and you may have heard this before, glad tidings of great joy. Well, glad tidings in the ESV brings out that it's good news. Well, what is it? Is it glad tidings or is it good news? Well, it's one word in the Greek. Yes, we have to use two in the English to understand one. Euangelion. And it's the word we understand as the gospel. Euangelion, gospel, good news. It is the gospel. He says, therefore I bring you good news of great joy. That's the result of good news that we are to have joy. Not fear that they had in response. So we should respond, enjoy the fact that Jesus was born. It should be celebrated. Not just once a year, but what a blessing that we live in a culture that is still recognizing Jesus today. And we can use it as a bridge. The fact that Jesus was born. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So he's saying today is born so what whatever that day is the angel is telling the shepherds that that day was then that jesus was born and it says in the city of david that's bethlehem a savior who is christ the lord that's a sermon for another time we could we could stop right here and just look at that concept but recognize that he's the savior he is the one who was prophesied that would come 
And we're going to look at Isaiah 9 very, very quickly soon uh, at looking at one of those prophecies concerning Jesus. But notice, it, it, He is the Savior, but He was also the Christ. The Christ who was prophesied. The Savior who was going to save us from our sins. Literally, God in the flesh that day. That is cause for great celebration and great joy. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom He is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem, that's the city of David, and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. He's bringing peace. Think about that. Think about what this, what this angel has told them. That's what they want more than anything. Who has conquered them at that time? Rome. Verse 15 or 16, And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Good news. Gospel. Verse 21. And at the end of eight days when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Well, that angel prophesied came to fruition and therefore they named Him Jesus, which means Emmanuel, God with us. But what's powerful is that angel predicting Jesus' conception and then His birth came well before... There, some, there came some messages well before that angel. And that's what we're going to look at in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 through the first part of verse 6. It says, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. A specific region. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil. Man, this time that Isaiah is referring to in prophecy is going to be a time of joy, a time of harvest, a time of gladness. What could he be talking about? Verse 4, For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramp tramping warrior in battle tumults and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. Isaiah is referring to the birth of Jesus. That this was going to be a time of gladness. A time of harvest. It's good news that Jesus was born. Because Jesus was born to bring good news. So it's good news Jesus was born, and Jesus was born to bring good news. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 14. It, this is something that Mark is referring to, and he, he's tr trying to say that yes, Jesus came, and His actual words that He proclaimed while He lived on this earth are euangelion. They're gospel. Good news. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, the good news of God, and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. You know, so often when we think of the concept of repentance, to repent, it's often well, it's, it said, well, you've got to repent of the things that you've done, the, the thoughts that you have, have had that are opposed to the Gospel. You need to change the way that you think. And oftentimes, that's the focus of repentance. But what Jesus has brought based on the Gospel, it's good news that you can repent. 
It's good news that you can think about something that is different than what this world has to offer. Because I don't know about you, but I can turn to any station on the news, any, different, any news broadcaster, and I'm going to find bad news. I can listen to it in the radio and I'm going to find bad news constantly. We are inundated with bad news. And how does that make us feel? As, as a people, we feel unsettled when we hear bad news. We, we, we feel negative, discontented by bad news. And what we're going to hear is bad news. But what Jesus is saying is you can hear good news. Isn't it a blessing that we have good news? It's not just that one little, one little feel-good snippet at 6 o'clock. It's good news that has not changed since the moment this was penned, the moment it was proclaimed through God, through the apostles and the prophets. It's good news. And it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So you and I can change the way that we think. We don't have to take what our government feeds us or what any government within this world feeds us. We can take the good news and that's a government we need to be holding to. The good news that's been established in the kingdom. What is the kingdom? It's not a kingdom that's earthly. And so therefore we can repent, but therefore we've, we can also believe in it. That means that this good news needs to be what's on my mind, on my tongue. I need to be proclaiming good news about the kingdom of God, not of any kingdoms in this world. Because we're only going, it's only going to result in bad news. And if I believe in the good news, then I'm going to be proclaiming Jesus Christ. Because Jesus came, he was born to bring good news. And that changes governments. That's why I said the word government, because that's what Isaiah said. If you will turn back to Isaiah chapter 9, we saw in the beginning of verse 6, it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Well, what's that going to do to the government? And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so what this is showing that any government who does is not on the shoulders of this child is not going to be wonderful. Any government who is not under God is not going to be wonderful. It's not going to be anything where we're going to find good counsel. It's not a government that will see God as mighty in any way. Maybe focused more on the mighty dollar than the in God we trust that's printed upon it. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government? Whose government is this talking to? The government of Jesus, the Son. Of the increase of His government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So brethren, we must recognize this government is not referring, Isaiah was not referring to America. <laughs> Isaiah was not referring to the United Nations. Isaiah was not referring to the commonwealth of England. He was referring to the church. And that's the only place we're going to find good news. And this world needs to recognize that. Now, if, if, if this nation would decide to maintain that God would be upon, or they would be upon God's shoulders, upon the shoulders of Jesus, that truly will be a strong nation. That's why I love when I go to Jefferson Christian Academy every morning, they, they do the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And, and you know, and I've said this before, but you'll hear them, it's just, and it's actually getting quieter and quieter when you hear them, especially in the high school. 
because the concept of the pledge to uh, allegiance to a flag, it's, it's, they're missing the point. It's one nation under God. And so I, I think I caused someone to be afraid, or, or, or I caused someone to be frightened one time because I said, one nation under God. And I said it quickly. I didn't just say one nation under God, indivisible. I said one nation under God. That's, that's, that's the pledge. And that's how we can serve God within this world, to be in the world and not of the world. We've got to recognize there's a balance. And Jesus was born to bring that balance because Jesus was born to bring good news. He was also born to become good news. To become it. If you will, look at John chapter 18. When Jesus is before Pilate, and we understand because we, we know the full account of what's about to take place. Can you imagine reading it for the first time? Verse 33, So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this or uh, of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have, de have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Obviously, since the Jews had delivered him over to them, they did not decide that their government would be upon his shoulder. They heard the prophecies of, of, of Isaiah and they chose not to listen. The power and the might that Jesus performed it caused them to know that he was someone great. They knew that he was the Messiah, and yet they would not listen and they handed him over to Pilate. And Pilate is sitting there just wanting to know as this tribune, as this governor of this region, who are you and what have you done? Verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is in America. No, he says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. He's saying, okay, you have a kingdom. You're a king. So you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. You heard me say something about a kingdom. You didn't hear that I said it's not of this world. You say that I'm a king. And then he says, for this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world. Don't stop there, because it sounds like he says, so you are a king. Okay, for, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world to be king. No, notice what it says. For this purpose I was born, and for, for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. The truth. Definite article. The truth. Not a truth. The truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to to my voice. And then Pilate says something that causes my blood to, to go cold. Because it just causes my hands to fall when I hear what Pilate has to say because I've heard so many people say it. What is truth? He is standing, literally looking face to face with the way, the truth, and the life and Pilate can't come to the Father except through Jesus. And he just says, what is truth? He has him right before him. Because Jesus was born to become good news. He was the Word that became flesh and was literally standing in front of Pilate. Pilate didn't recognize it. In the same way today, people, don't say, people say there's no, there's no truth. There's a truth, your truth, my truth, but there's no the in that word before it. And so because of that, someone can be as passionate as can be with their politics. And someone will be completely polar opposite in their passion and their politics, opposing that individual and vice versa. That's not good news. When it comes to the Gospel that, that, that Jesus is proclaiming, it it transcends opinion. What Jesus says is true, and if we'll, we'll simply follow it, we'll experience peace. We'll experience the 
blessings of joy. But again, it's a choice. It's a choice whether we will, we will follow that good news or not. The good news is proclaimed. But you and I, can, we, can, we can take it or leave it. And sometimes we've left it because we have religion we have, we have religion and then we have politics. And the two shouldn't, shouldn't go hand in hand. Where is that found within Scripture? Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And Jesus became good news in another way. And, and it's something that we often hear when we hear the concept of good news. And that's what Paul was preaching to Corinth. If you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel, the good news, the euangelion, the very word that the angel said to the shepherds. He says, which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word, I preach to you unless you believed in vain. You know, that's the same concept that Jesus came proclaiming repentance and belief. They need to repent and believe. The concept of repentance is holding fast to the gospel unless we believed in vain. If we don't hold fast to the gospel, it shows that we don't believe. Or it shows that we believed in the past, but it was all vanity. It was all empty. So if we believe, we will repent. And we will show that repentance. People will see a difference in us than the world. They will see those who are being saved. For I deliver to you as of first importance, verse 3, what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That He was buried. That He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. So when He says, I would remind you of the Gospel I preached to you, and then He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance that He died, buried, and rose again, that means the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. So Jesus was born to become good news. And it's good news that Jesus was born because He came to proclaim good news. So His birth, His life, His death, His burial, and His resurrection shows us the concept of good news. That is the, that is the quickest summary of, of the New Covenant. Of the New Testament, I think I've ever delivered. Jesus was born to become good news so that you and I could be reborn. So that you and I could proclaim becoming good news to others. So, when we take hold of this, this concept of the good news, people will see it in our lives. They'll see a difference, right? Right? Well, where, does that, where does that transformation take place? Well, that's what Paul was talking about when he spoke to the Romans in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, beginning. If you'll turn there with me. It says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Man, never, regard, think about this. If we who are Christians, again, he's talking to the Roman Christians. He's saying, if you just continue in sin and just allow sin to reign in your mortal body, what good are you doing for the good news? You will literally become bad news for Christ. Because people will look at someone and says, isn't that person a Christian? If that's Christ, I don't want any part in Him. It's the biggest form of causing of, of, of atheism. In the name of Jesus, people will, will not represent His actual teaching or His actual works. If we don't live lives of repentance, we don't truly believe. That will then cause people not to believe and therefore not repent. We're, ca we're causing it when we don't live up to the standard that Jesus proclaimed. He says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into His death. We were buried therefore with Him by baptism, by immersion 
into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. A brand new life. That's the concept of being born again. Do you notice the death, the burial, and the resurrection that we can take part in? We literally take part in the Gospel. We literally become good news for others. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What does it mean to be a disciple? Someone who is a disciplined follower of Jesus. People will see the disciplines of Jesus in, in our lives and they will t- they'll be able to tell that person follows Christ. That person has become someone different. Especially those who have known us in our lives before, they're going to see something different in our walk with God. So Christians who, are, who become the Gospel, who become the good news, can be born again to bring good news to other people. That is, that is the Great Commission. And we're going to be focusing in 2020 on that concept. We'll, we'll, the first Sunday after the new year, we're going to map out what the plan is for 2020. But we've already mentioned the focus is reach out. Reach out. That's the job that God has commissioned for us to do. And we get that from Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them, or make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always even to the end of the age. So as we reach out, Jesus is reaching through us. So Christians could be born again to bring good news. We're born again to a new life to bring new children to God. That's our purpose. So we're left with this concept. We're left with the concept that it's good news that Jesus was born. Have you taken hold of the good news this morning? We have have an invitation. We have an invitation for you to grab hold of that good news. To to repent and believe in what that good news is. And if you're going to believe, you're going to obey that message, we recognize that that gospel is that we, we die to ourselves. We are buried in that watery grave of baptism. We rise to walk a brand new child of God proclaiming the good news, not living for the bad of this world any longer. Maybe you're here this morning and you have been just inundated with bad news and it's affected your focus. It's affected your your walk. That's what Peter was saying in Acts 2 and verse 40. Save yourself from this crooked generation. Don't go get wrapped back up in it. Do you need to be straightened back out through the Gospel? Maybe through the prayers of this body. we're, We're here to encourage you. Whatever your need is, come. While together we stand and while we sing.